The devoutly religious man was angry. He was angry at the country where he lived. He was angry at the government. He was angry at the way that the country pursued war abroad, the way it treated its people within the borders. And the devoutly religious man was angry at some of the people who shared his faith. He thought of them as insufficiently zealous in their faith. It's too cowardly and too passive. The devoutly religious man prayed to God for direction. And in his prayers, he heard God answer him, saying, you must act. The devoutly religious man knew of others who shared his anger. They met together in a secret cell. They shared together that sense that God was calling them to act. Together, they decided that what they would do would be to build a bomb and that a member of that cell would smuggle the bomb onto an airplane where he would detonate the bomb, killing himself and everyone else aboard. They all agreed with the plan and put the plan in motion. I've told this story in an intentionally vague way. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to the identity of this devoutly religious man? Well, in this instance, the person that I'm talking about is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran pastor who lived in Nazi Germany and was part of the Confessing Church, a group of Christians who resisted the rise of the Third Reich. During World War II, Bonhoeffer participated in a secret group that acted to undermine German efforts to conquer Europe and even plotted to kill Hitler. The group constructed a bomb, which then was smuggled aboard Hitler's plane by Bonhoeffer's brother-in-law. In March 1943, Hitler boarded a plane on which a bomb had been stowed away. But the fuse did not ignite. The bomb failed to detonate. Bonhoeffer was arrested a month later by the German SS and eventually was sent to the Flossenburg concentration camp where he was later executed. The writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, his work of theology, which is entitled The Cost of Discipleship, along with his letters and journals from prison, are still, to my knowledge, required reading in most divinity school programs. I remembered the first time I read Bonhoeffer. I was shaken. Here we were being required to read a theologian and a pastor who was writing that sometimes who was writing that sometimes being true to your faith, being true to your understanding of God, being true to your deepest ethical convictions, might require you to plant a bomb on an airplane or assassinate a head of state or overthrow your government. I remember reading it and being a little unsure about what exactly we should say about it in class. We were reading it, after all, just a few weeks after September 11th. And then here it was. I was supposed to come to class and say, oh, Bonhoeffer, good stuff. He really clarified for me when it is that I might be expected to kill in the name of God. Am I making anyone else uncomfortable here? Anyone else uncomfortable? I'll say after coming back from summer break, um, I've led some kind of upbeat, really joyful services. This isn't one of them. <laughs> we had one up on the theology of play. We had a really joyful celebration of, of marriage equality. Um, there was the service where I came dressed in a camel costume. This is a little bit different. Um, next week, I should say, I'm preaching on forgiveness. So... Um, if you disagree with me today, come back next week and I'll, I'll apologize to you. <laughs> but the example of Dietrich Bonhoeffer with which I began this sermon raises some troubling issues. Namely, is it ever morally justified to kill in the name of God? Is it ever morally justified to kill in the name of God? After all, had they succeeded with their plot 
World War II might have ended two years sooner. One million, two million Jews or more might have been spared. The gas chambers. There would have been millions fewer deaths of Americans and British and Russians, Germans and Japanese. In fact, the Japanese might very well have surrendered before the invention of the atomic bomb. But just note, just note that if you would admit that you wish that they had been successful, if you wish Bonhoeffer had been successful, you're also saying that religiously motivated violence can be justified, that there are times when it is okay to kill in the name of God, and that sometimes the will of God is that we put a bomb on an airplane. And isn't that troubling? History provides numerous examples of times when Unitarians have killed in the name of God. How many people here knew that? How many people are surprised to hear that? How many people aren't really listening and paying attention? <laughs> well, here, this, is, this is interesting. If you go back to Boston in the mid-19th century, you find a prominent Unitarian minister named Theodore Parker. Parker originated both the phrase Martin Luther King would make famous about the moral arc of the universe bending towards justice. He also originated the phrase that Lincoln made famous about government being by, of, and for the people. Parker, it was said, wrote his sermons with a gun on his desk, ready to defend the fugitive slaves he and his church members harbored. Parker also famously performed a marriage ceremony for William and Ellen Craft two uh, escaped slaves who had made it to the north. Parker's church was going to fund them uh, to travel to uh, England, where they would be able to live the rest of their life in freedom, uh, freedom from slavery. Um, but before they left, Parker officiated a wedding ceremony for them, since it was illegal for slaves to be married in the south. During the wedding ceremony, Parker took hold of a sword and put it in William Craft's hand. And he said that it is God's will that he and his wife live in freedom and that violence for the purpose of protecting that freedom was virtuous in the eyes of God. Then there was the Boston Vigilance Committee, which Parker helped to found. The Vigilance Committee helped to conduct the Underground Railroad in Boston and plotted to thwart the efforts of those who attempted to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. So in 1854, a 19-year-old fugitive slave from Virginia named Anthony Burns was apprehended by federal agents in Boston. The Vigilance Committee, 2,000 members strong, including hundreds, hundreds of Unitarians, gathered in a public square in Boston to decide on a course of action, Theodore Parker addressed the crowd, saying, I love peace, but there's a means and there is an end. Liberty is the end, and sometimes peace is not the means towards it. I have heard hurrahs and cheers for liberty many times. I have not seen a great many deeds done for liberty. I ask you, are we to have deeds as well as words? Parker then told the crowd to reconvene the next morning, where they would plan a raid on the federal courthouse to rescue Anthony Burns. The crowd was not pleased. They wanted to go to the courthouse right away, and they did. They formed a mob, stormed the federal courthouse, where 50 guards kept Anthony Burns captive behind barricaded doors. Unitarian minister Thomas Wentworth Higginson arrived with a battering ram and led the charge, knocking down the doors to the federal courthouse. Isn't that a, what an image. Unitarian minister Thomas Wentworth Higginson arrived and led the charge with a battering ram, knocking down the doors to the federal courthouse. A violent melee ensued in which Reverend Higginson was slashed on the cheek with a saber. Gunshots rang out. The mob was repulsed but not before a federal deputy lay dead, stabbed to death in the riot. Later, Parker would speak publicly, calling the officer's death his own fault, saying he liked the business of enslaving a man and so has gone to render an account to God for his gratuitous wickedness. 
And then there was the time that a network of Unitarians materially supported an attack on a United States military installation and helped to plot a violent rebellion through the South. Of the secret six who funded John Brown, five were Unitarians. These Unitarians financially backed his raid on an armory in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, which left several dead. And when John Brown went to the gallows for treason and sedition, All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. Mark, All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. told its bell to honor John Brown and praise his act of treason. It's been said that a sermon is supposed to have both explication, the explanation of an idea, and application, direction to the gathered congregation on how to live out that idea. That part probably has you a little bit nervous, doesn't it? <laughs> but I, I, want to leave, I want to leave the world of the 1860s and leave the world of 1940s and come to the present day. And I want to actually leave the world of, of violence and nonviolence and talk instead, sort of parenthetically, about resistance and non-resistance. This past summer I read the latest book by Chris Hedges, um, who is one of the, I think, one of the truly great prophetic thinkers of our time. Hedges has written ten books. I've read almost all of them. He's not a UU, but he knows of us. He was a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Um, a few weeks ago, he spoke, uh, gave, giving the eulogy for his best friend, a Unitarian minister in Boston. Anyways, Hedge's newest book is entitled Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. And I want to be clear, he doesn't talk about the moral imperative to violence. In fact, Hedges sides against violence. But his book is all about praising and insisting on the importance of people who decide to break the law in order to do what they believe is good. He says, there's nothing rational about rebellion. To rebel against insurmountable odds is an act of faith, without which the rebel is doomed. This faith is intrinsic to the rebel the way caution and prudence are intrinsic to those who seek to fit into existing power structures. The rebel, possessed by inner demons and angels, is driven by a vision. I do not know if the new revolutionary wave and the rebels produced by it will succeed, but I do know that without rebels we are doomed." Hedges, in fact, in his book, cites the work of a pair of contemporary political scientists who have studied worldwide resistance movements over the past century and concluded that nonviolent rebellion movements, nonviolent resistance movements, are actually twice as likely to succeed as violent ones. And the political scientists who Hedges quote claim that internally members of a regime, civil servants, security forces, members of the judiciary, are more likely to shift loyalty toward nonviolent opposition groups than toward violent opposition groups. Claims that nonviolence is an important tool in swaying public opinion. In the past year, I think it's worth noting that we've also seen a rise in the number of thinkers who have come out and questioned nonviolence. Here is Tanahasi Coates writing about violent demonstrations in Baltimore last April. Coates writes, when nonviolence is preached as an attempt to evade the repercussions of brutality, nonviolence betrays itself. When nonviolence begins halfway through the war with the aggressor calling time out, it exposes itself as a ruse when nonviolence is preached by the representatives of the state, while the state doles out heaps of violence to its citizens. Nonviolence reveals itself to be a con. A similar point is made by queer activist Benji Hart. 
Nonviolence, he says, is a type of political performance designed to raise awareness and win over sympathy. But when those with privilege have demonstrated repeatedly that they do not care, are not invested, and are not going to step in line to defend the oppressed, nonviolence then becomes a futile political strategy. It fails to meet the needs of the community and puts oppressed people further in danger of violence. What Coates and Hart are each saying is that nonviolence only works when it is clear that it is one tactic among many and when it is the freely chosen tactic of the oppressed, not a tactic mandated by the oppressor. What Coates and Hart are each saying is that nonviolence has no virtue in and of itself. It is virtuous only to the extent that it helps to advance justice. A powerful idea that nonviolence has no virtue in and of itself. Its only virtue is to the extent that it helps to extend and advance justice. So what I want to do is I actually want to take a moment in our American public life right now from this past week um, that many of us have actually talked about. Um, it's a case of, of disobeying the law, um, but it's uh, one that many of us would disagree with. That clerk in Kentucky um, who made the news by refusing to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples went to jail for disobeying the court order that she do so. Now, a lot's been said on this matter, probably too much. Most of you probably came to church hoping for a reprieve from this story. But I want to take it in a little bit of a different direction. I want us to imagine, I want us to imagine an alternative universe, an alternative universe in which same-sex marriage is illegal. I know that's difficult to imagine. And we could imagine within that alternative universe, we could imagine a Unitarian Universalist who works as a clerk. This UU, let's say his name is David Kim. This UU is a man of deep faith. Now imagine this faithful UU deciding that his beliefs dictated that he not follow unjust laws, so he begins issuing marriage licenses to gay and lesbian couples. We can imagine that David would be ordered to stop by a judge and that he would refuse this order. We can imagine David going to jail and all of us crying passionately for his release. We can imagine his being released from jail and pledging to continue to defy an unjust law. In this alternative universe, David would be a hero for us, correct? We would praise his courage his defiance, his sense of right. And what this means to me is that in this case, the law is really an abstraction. Separation of church and state is an abstraction. Freedom of religion is an abstraction. But right and wrong are real. And for us, we know that homophobia is wrong and that opposing homophobia is right, whether the law is on our side or not. Even if it meant going to jail, it would be the right thing to do. For Theodore Parker and the Boston Unitarians, and John Brown's Secret Six and All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C., slavery was wrong. And so for them, opposing slavery was the right thing to do. For Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the officers who were part of that plot, fascism and genocide were wrong and opposing fascism and genocide was right, whatever the cost. For us, we would say that homophobia is wrong and that opposing homophobia is right. In an alternate universe, that might mean going to jail to oppose homophobia. Or in this world, it might mean someone sending someone to jail for refusing to enforce justice. I'm reminded as I wrote this sermon that in the past couple of years, this church sent more than two dozen members to jail, arrested in Raleigh for doing what is right. And so my message this morning, the application 
is to do what's right. To do what's right. Knowing that sometimes the cost is immense. I'm sure that uh, this will provoke some conversations during coffee hour, and, uh, and I invite you to have them. Um, and if you disagree with me, disagree with me passionately, remember that next Sunday I'll be talking about forgiveness. <laughs> and let me know if I need to ask for it. And so with this, um, the sermon part of the service has ended, um, and we'll have our offertory now.